Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Marshfield, Wisconsin, on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost, perhaps better known as Father's Day, and most recently known as Juneteenth, Independence Holiday Weekend. And in all of that, I offer this, may the grace and peace of Christ help you however you need to be helped this day as we gather in Christ's name. I'd like to offer a special welcome to any of you who may be newcomers in the sanctuary or online. Your presence adds to our worship. We are glad you are here. And it is our mission to offer the inclusive, embracing love of Christ, which is unconditional to all who gather, no matter what your status or station in life may be. You are welcome. Now, a couple of announcements. Yes, I meant to also say, if you are new uh, we, and you haven't yet, we'd love for you to fill out our green visitor card uh, and put it in the offering plate when it gets passed later in the service. Uh, the flowers here in our sanctuary are a gift from the memorial service we had for uh, Margie Fornafelt on Friday at Hanson Schilling Funeral Home. As I mentioned at her service, Margie was a member here at FPC for 81 years. She joined our church in 1939. And one program note, uh, we will be singing all four stanzas of our first hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Just keep singing and you'll see why. 
that is necessary. <laughs> and on that note, I invite you to stand as you are able as we prepare for our call to worship led by Jerry Toyama, our elector today. As Lori said last week, it's really nice to look out and see people out here now. It's a great feeling. All right, uh, family of faith, this must be the place. This is the place for connection and growth, for community and hope. This must be the place for questions like, where are you from? What do you need? For whispers of, I've been thinking of you and I've been meaning to ask. This must be the place because all belong here. All are welcome here. All hurt and joy, needs and prayers, dreams and love are welcome here. God is near. Let us worship God. be seated. Here is a call of con to confession. How many of you have ever had a bad day and found someone offering you unsolicited advice? How many of you have ever had a bad week and had someone rush in with dozens of suggestions for how you might fix things, as if you hadn't already thought of them before? We have all been there, and we have all done that. It is part of our humanity. Our scripture reminds us today that often in the face of hurt, what people really need is not a list of advice or solutions, but the simple presence of love. So let us pray to God today, acknowledging that we are works in progress and that relationships always come with mistakes and confessions. Let us pray together our unison prayer, prayer of confession. Gracious God, sometimes life feels like cooking with flour. It looks like it should be easy, but we always make a mess. This is particularly true when it comes to our relationships. We so desperately long to say the right thing, to do the right thing, to find the right solution, that we overstep the line. Forgive us for assuming the place you feel Forgive us for imagining that we, in all our humanity, could possibly fix all the hurt in this world. Instead, give us the grace and the strength to stand by our loved ones in their moment of need, to witness their hurt without trying to fix it. You are God. We are not. Teach us how to be a friend. Teach us how to ask, what do you need? Teach us how to point to you. 
Gratefully, we pray. Let us enter into a brief period of silence where you may offer your individual silent confessions to God. Lord, hear our prayer and change our lives until we illustrate the grace of the God who makes all things new. Amen. The assurance of pardon of, and of God's love and mercy. Family of faith, no matter how many times you have spoken without listening, assumed without knowing, offered without asking, or rushed without waiting, you are forgiven. God knows your desire and your intent. God knows when we try and miss the mark, and God surrounds us in grace. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Every day is a new day for love. We are claimed. We are forgiven. We are invited into relationship. Thanks be to God for growth and grace that we know no end. Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we are called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with those around us. A wave, a fist bump, a handshake, or an accepted hug. These are all heavenly forms of passing the peace. See. Please join me in our unison prayer for illumination. God of long winters and longer summers, in the words of Paul, do your best to come to us quickly. Come to us with loud praise, joy, or appear to us in a still, small voice. Or come to us through strangers. Come to us in this text and in this hour of worship. Come to us quickly, if you can. We are seeking you. We are always seeking you. With grateful hearts, cracked open by love, we pray, amen. 
The first scripture reading is from Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz from Tamanite, Bildad the Shuite, and so far the, the Naumenote. They met together to go so console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for discovery time. And they actually have a special little <clears throat> skit to start us off today. So let me give this one to Emmett. And this one, I'm going to start over here. Get your flower to Peyton. And roll it. I brought you flowers, Emmett. I bet this cheers you up. Thanks, Peyton. Your favorite. No one can be sad when there's muffins around. Sure, thanks. Okay, Emmett, I give up. What do you need? I just need a friend to sit down with me while I'm sad. Can you do that for me? Of course. I'm sorry I didn't think to ask before. You know, Emmett, this reminds me of something in the Bible. When Paul was lonely and in prison, he wanted his friend to come quickly. Yeah, or the story of Job. When he was sad, his friends came to sit with him. Job had been through so much, he was so sick, they didn't even recognize him. And his friends didn't know what to say. So they sat with him 
and didn't say a word for a whole week. I feel like that right now. I'm sorry you're sad, Emmett. I hope you're feeling better soon. If you're staying here with me, I bet I will. Thanks. The end of the skit, very good. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> So, I have a couple of questions for you guys, kind of coming from this skit. And the first is, <clears throat> when you are feeling sad, what can, what can your family or friends do or have done to make you feel any better? Can you think of anything? When you're feeling sad, what helps you? Kind of hard to say, isn't it? <clears throat> That's what we're learning about today. Is there anything that you can think of to do for someone else when you see that they're feeling sad, like let's say your best friend or uh, maybe somebody in your family? Is there something that you can do? Ask what's wrong. Ask what's wrong? Yeah, ask them what's wrong. Any ideas, Peyton? Mm -hmm. Ask if they want to do something fun. <laughs> that, that's a good idea, too. Uh, the thing that I think maybe we, we realize, if we think about it, is that everybody needs something a little different, right? And sometimes we need, one person needs something different depending on what's going on. That one thing never always helps, as much as we may like muffins. A muffin is not always the answer. Well, thank you very much for giving us this skit uh, and helping us to think about <clears throat> what these scriptures are calling us to consider today. And we're going to close with this prayer. You can um, uh, repeat each phrase after me. Dear God, Dear God, Dear God <clears throat> thank you for friends that help us. Thank, thank you, you for friends, friends that help, help us. Even when that help is just being with us. Even, Even when that helps help Jesus, Jesus being with us. Help us. Help, help us. To remember to ask others. To remember, remember to, to ask, ask others. What they need. What they need. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I needed you to help me with the skit, so thanks for that. You're welcome. And if you have an uh, offering for the blessing box, you can put that in there. And then Carmen um, will uh, take you to a an undisclosed place for Sunday school. <laughs> Thank you. Here, you can give me the mic. Thanks. As for me, I'm already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I'm guessing that you may have heard that scripture before. It is often read at a funeral or a graveside service, a beautiful testimony and reflection from a person of deep faith who knows their days on earth are about to end. That's 2 Timothy 4, 6-7. What you have likely not heard is the scripture that comes right after that. Today's second scripture lesson, it starts with, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. You won't see that engraved on a tombstone or embroidered in a counted cross-stitch sampler, I'm guessing. Yet we are going to see what it can teach us today. For it is scripture, and in our Bible, just as much as a verse like John 3.16. In this same letter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we read this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. 
Now, to plumb the depths of this verse would be another sermon for another day. For now, it simply challenges us to seek what our, ver- our scripture today, 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 18, along with our first lesson that Jerry read from Job, have to teach us as we continue our training in righteousness now in the third of our four-week sermon series titled, I've Been Meaning to Ask. We do have our work cut out for us, for this text sounds more like a hastily scribbled list of random requests and rants from a tired, discouraged, lonely apostle on his last nerve, as well as his last legs. You may hear a faint echo of the genre in which a religious hero is preparing to pass the torch to the next generation. Our Bible contains several passing the torch speeches from Jacob, Moses, Joshua, and Jesus. The truth is, we don't really know who wrote this in 2 Timothy. Although this book is called the second letter of Paul to Timothy, it was most likely not written by Paul. Several key indicators suggest it was written by a later disciple in the Pauline tradition, reinterpreting and carrying on Paul's message to the third generation of Christians and beyond. But for convenience today, I'm going to refer to the writer as Paul in my sermon. As we now partake in the sacred, let us listen between the lines for what Paul needs most of all as I read from 2 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come back, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You also must be aware of him, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to, support, came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through the message, through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes, heavenly words for earthly people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be attuned to your message, what we need to hear from you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, let's begin with a family that, uh, with a game that our family used to play called Would You Rather? It was actually a favorite of my husband, Bob, who played it with our two girls as they were growing up. And now it has taken on a new life with our Grandpa Bob and our now three-year-old Isabel, who is already very full of opinions and preferences. We will just play one round here today. So are you ready? Here's the question. Would you rather be the helper or the helpee? That is, the person who is in a position to offer help and assist another person in need, or help or be the person who is having trouble or problems and needs the help of one kind or another. So raise your hand. Would you rather be the helper or the helpee? I was planning on it going that way. (laughs) Good job. Um, I think most of us, if we have the choice, would rather be Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar helping out the inexplicably tricking stricken friend Job, or we would rather be Timothy, Luke, or Mark coming to the aid of our friend Paul who is in prison and nearing his dying day. However, as much as we prefer to be the helper, it is hard to know how to help. You saw our children were struggling as well, as as much as we do as grown-ups. 
And the more proactive, analytic, a problem solver you may be, the harder it is. Job's friends do it successfully for seven days. That's right. The wisest thing you can do is to show up, to be present to the person or persons in need, and then simply and wisely listen. Now, if you are familiar with the book of Job, you know his friends did not remain silent on day eight. For seven days and nights, they were extremely helpful doing exactly what Job needed, staying with him, empathizing with him. But then on day eight, they started trying to explain to Job why his life, his livelihood, and his physical health had totally fallen apart. First round, Eliphaz said it was because Job had sinned. Bildad told Job he should repent, and Zophar said that Job deserved the punishment he was getting. That's right. Can you believe it? And that was just the first of several rounds where Job's three friends continued to try to come up with reasons for Job's horrendous afflictions and misfortune. I was talking with my sister Lynn about this sermon on the phone and the lesson from Job's friends about the need to show up and be present and resist the temptation to fill the silence with a helpie's need to talk or explain or cheer up the hurting one all of which she agreed with, but then she wisely pointed out, but you can't exactly do that when you're on the phone. I mean, you have to say something. So what can we say? Uh, so let's, uh, we're going to get to listen and learn from Kate Bowler for a moment here. Kate was only 35 years old when she was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. Out of that life-changing, life-challenging experience, she wrote a book titled, Everything Happens for a Reason, in which she shared what words actually helped her and can help others when they're having a rough time. I've picked just three of them to share. First, I'm so grateful to hear about how you're doing. Just know that I'm on your team. She writes, you mean I don't have to give you an update? You ask someone else for the gory details? Great, now I feel I get to feel like you are both informed and concerned. What you have said is amazing, don't, so don't screw it up now by being a nosy Nelly. Ask a question about any other aspect of my life. That's the first one. Second thing to say, oh my friend, that sounds so hard. Perhaps the weirdest thing about having something awful happen is the fact that no one wants to hear about it. People tend to want to hear the summary but they don't usually want to hear it from you, and that it was awful. So just simmer down, let your friend talk for a bit. Be willing to stare down the ugliness and sadness. Life is absurdly hard, and pretending it isn't is exhausting. Her final one is our lesson from Job. One word, silence. She writes, the truth is that no one knows what to say. It's awkward. Pain is awkward. Tragedy is awkward. People's weird, suffering bodies are awkward. But take the advice of one man who wrote to me with his policy, which I say I have rephrased for the pulpit, which goes like this. Show up and keep your trap shut. You figure it out. <laughs> this teaching applies not only to grown-ups dealing with cancer, but also to teen hurts and issues as well. Anyone who has raised a child knows that meeting the needs of a teenage son or daughter is a moving target. Rarely are teens as explicit as Paul was in his letter to Timothy about what they need. Author Tim O'Brien, best known for his, books, his book, The Things They Carried, wrote a story in his most recent work titled Dad's Maybe Book, about a revelatory moment when he was trying to help his 14-year-old son, Timmy, which he titled, Getting Cut, and it goes like this. At 5 feet 10 inches, he now looks down on me with the eyes of a grown man. He values things I never valued. He is confident in ways that I am not. Without saying so, he wants me to back off, to stop asking questions about his homework, to stop monitoring his computer time, to stop telling him when to go to bed each night, and to stop offering amateurish basketball tips. 
In a sense, I suppose, he wants me to stop being a father. And so, two days ago, Timmy was cut from his high school's basketball team. It hurt him, yes, but he stayed quiet. He didn't moan, he didn't complain, he blamed no one. He handled failure with a grace amounting to a controlled and elegant beauty. Are you okay? I asked many times. In a flatly inexpressive voice, many times, he said, I'm fine. Did he cry? I don't know. Did he feel defeated? Did his faith in the power of perseverance collapse? Did he scream at the ceiling? I don't know, maybe briefly. Are you okay? I kept asking every day, and every day he said, fine. But he wasn't fine. His bedroom stayed more firmly closed than ever. He was silent at meals. He did his homework, shot baskets alone in the backyard, and plotted again with mulish, stone-faced resignation. He wasn't fine, and he still isn't. Six more days have passed. Timmy's silence remains impenetrable. So this morning when I asked how he was doing, he said, I probably wasn't good enough, but I don't want to talk about it. Not even a little? No, he said. Okay, I told him, but I'm here to listen. Thanks, he said. Another week and a half go by. I asked Timmy if he wanted to watch a Celtic Cavaliers game. He shook his head and walked away, but a half hour later, he joined me on the couch, gave me a kiss, and said, there's nothing I can do except keep trying to get better. I won't stop, Dad. Okay, I said. I love you, he said. To receive unbidden the words, I love you, from a 14-year-old boy makes getting cut seem a weirdly desirable outcome, a thing to be prized. Am I wrong, I wonder, to suppose that fathers everywhere crave what I crave, which is not a basketball excellence, not aggressiveness, not speed, not skill, not physical virtuosity, but just a gentle kiss out of nowhere, a quiet, I love you out of a tight-lipped teenage blue. I want to take this to one other level, which is this. I believe there is an important aspect of this helper helpy dynamic when it comes to doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God, as the prophet Micah wisely said. For whether it is white, American, well-meaning Christian missionaries imposing our idea of what another culture really needs without asking them, or if it is white privilege that insists on telling people of color what they need, God is calling us to stop and listen. Let those who are experiencing injustice tell us what they need, even when it's hard to hear, especially then. And so in that spirit, I will let Opal Lee have the final words in my sermon today. Opal Lee is a 94-year-old activist and lifelong Texan who has been campaigning to make June 19th a national holiday for years. She experienced a hate crime at age 12 in Fort Worth, Texas, where a mob of 500 white supremacists set fire to her home and vandalized it. The structure was destroyed and no arrests were made. Experiencing that crime at her young age pushed Opal into a life of teaching, activism, and eventually campaigning to get Juneteenth named a national holiday. You may have heard about her because she walked two and a half miles a day, making her way from Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, D.C. to symbolize the two and a half years that black Texans were made to wait between Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, abolishing slavery, and the day that the message arrived in Galveston, where black people were still enslaved two and a half years later, on June 19th, 1865. So what did she need? Here is what she says. 
to make people aware that none of us are free until we're all free and we aren't free yet. She listed the disparities in education, jobs, and health care. And she sees unity as what we need to do to get together and do something about homelessness, about decent housing, decent food, and decent education. And th these are her words. If we could just love one another, you know? If you could just get past the color of my skin and love me like you do that boy, ne that boy next door to you. So friends, would you rather be the helper or the helpy? This is actually yet another false binary. As Opal pointed out, we aren't free until we are all free. And we are all people who need help and are able to give help. And together, these things make us whole within ourselves and as a culture and as a society. And we take one more step toward freedom when we lift up our eyes unto the hills, saying, from whence cometh my help? And we listen as God tells us again and again, my help, our help, cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. this um, prayer, a Father's Day prayer. Heavenly Father, today we ask you to bless our earthly fathers for the many times they reflected the love, strength, generosity, wisdom, and mercy that you exempl exemplify in your relationship with us, your children. We honor our fathers for putting our needs above their own convenience and comfort for teaching us how to show courage and determination in the face of adversity, for challenging us to move beyond self-limiting boundaries, and for modeling the qualities that would turn us into responsible, principled, caring adults. Not all our fathers lived up to these ideals. Give them the grace to acknowledge and learn from their mistakes, and give us grace to extend to them the same forgiveness that you offer us all. Help us to resist the urge to stay stuck in past bitterness, instead moving forward with humility and peace of heart. We ask your blessing on those people who served as father figures in our lives when our biological fathers weren't able to do so. May the love and selfless, selflessness they showed us be returned to them in all their relationships and help them to know that their influence has changed us for the better. Give new and future fathers the guidance they need to raise happy and holy children, 
grounded in a love for God and other people, and remind these fathers about treating their spouses with dignity, compassion, and respect as one of the greatest gifts that they can give their children. We give thanks for our fathers who have passed into the next life, have been welcomed into your loving embrace, and that our family will one day be reunited in your heavenly kingdom. We offer this prayer that I have spoken out loud and all those in our hearts in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we love someone in need, it is easy to give. We show up with casseroles and prayer blankets. We send cards, make phone calls. We don't think twice about it, because when we love someone in need, it is easy to give. In worship, when we give to the offering, what we are also declaring is that not just those we love are worthy of our gifts, but God is worthy of our gifts, and strangers whom we have never met are worthy of our gifts. In worship, when we give to the offering, we are dedicating, declaring that all of creation deserves love and care, which is a radical notion in this hurting world. So today, as a way to practice being in relationship and drawing closer to one another, I invite you to give to the mission and ministry of this church. For when we have love, it is easy to give. Join me in our unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Most holy God, who hears our prayers and answers them, gives us more than we can ask or imagine. Accept these offerings and use them to your glory, that even now we might imitate your coming reign of justice, peace, and love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
to leave our time of worship. May God grant you the curiosity to counter assumptions, the vulnerability to befriend, the bravery to speak your truth, the wisdom to listen, and the resilience to choose love, even when it's hard. Being aware, stay aware of the Holy Spirit always, always by your side. And now in the name of God, who is love, go in peace. And all of God's children said together, Amen. Amen.